It doesn't matter to him that we're building one of the biggest wind turbines or that we built the first hybrid battery gas turbine or that our technology powers a third of the planet. What matters to him is that it's getting dark and he has homework to do. Hi, everybody. Uh, the 
title of our panel is Delivering the Clean Energy Future. Um, the, I'll introduce my panelists and myself really quickly. I'm Lori Coben. I'm a Senior Managing Director at Guggenheim. And we're fortunate to have with us Sean Trosky, who is the Chairman and CEO of OGE Energy. Tony Clark, who is uh, at a Senior Advisor at Wilkinson Barker Nauer and uh, former FERC and state regulator, and Jason Gromay, who is the founder and president of the Bipartisan Policy Center. The whole conversation we're having today is about getting the public more interested and supportive of a clean en investing in a clean energy grid that's smarter, more resilient, and flexible, and able to deliver cleaner energy going forward. Um, and we're going to be talking a little bit about what it takes for the industry to win that sort of support. So, uh, Sean, uh, let's start with you. OG&E serves about 850,000 customers in a 30,000 square mile service territory. You have a diverse fuel mix. You've been uh, decarbonizing your resources. What do you think is the role of... Uh, building new infrastructure and delivering the clean energy future? And how do you see that unfolding? Yeah, thank you, Lori. Um, without a doubt, I believe it's um, absolutely critical. And when we use that word infrastructure, it takes a lot of different forms. You know, it could be cleaner source of electricity, it could be transmission lines, it could be pipelines, it could be substations, it could be any number of large investments that will benefit generations to come. I think what's important though is that um, that process gets streamlined and where we have the rules of the road, so to speak, to enable all of those opportunities. You know, as I look across our company, look at our customers, but, and I think this applies industry-wide. You know, customers are looking for a cleaner source of electricity. They're looking for um, us to maintain affordability, and they're looking for increased levels of reliability. And I think the key message there when we speak about infrastructure is you want to keep all of those in balance. And so um, if we're going to make this transition, and we are as an industry, and we are as a company, to a cleaner future, you know, continuing to invest in infrastructure that supports a cleaner environment, more affordable opportunities and um, more reliable and resilient systems. I think that's the, the pathway to success. Tony, building on that, um, you've seen both the state and federal policy and some of the tensions between the two. Can you uh, tell us some of the trends you see in both of those arenas and um, give us a sense of how that might affect uh, companies like Sean's in trying to uh, deliver this clean energy future? Sure, Lori. Thanks. And uh, good to be with you. And thanks for the question. Um, really, there are two trends that have become more pronounced in, in recent years that I've noticed uh, with regard to, to getting infrastructure built. The first one being that it's just getting more difficult to build infrastructure across the, the board. It doesn't matter if it's pipelines or transmission lines. It's just much more difficult. For years, as a regulator, um, both at the state level and at the federal level, uh, permitting both uh, transmission lines, electric transmission lines and pipelines, I would have said that electric transmission lines were tougher to build than pipelines because to, to a great degree, pipelines, once they're built, are out of sight, out of mind. Electric transmission lines have a much higher visibility uh, for landowners and, uh, and um, affected residences around them. I would say today it's equally tough to build either electric transmission or pipelines and for an, a number of reasons. Um, the, the second big trend that you've seen is a politicization of infrastructure in general. Um, it used to be when permitting a project, you would have intervener groups that might oppose a particular project for very specific reasons related to maybe the placement of that, that pipeline or the transmission line. They prefer that it be location A as opposed to location B. Now what you see is just an outright opposition to the infrastructure in general. 
Um, and a lot of it comes down to the politics. It may not be about that particular piece of pipe or that particular transmission line. It's about bigger themes related to climate change or the energy policy of the state in general. And you see this in um, statements that state officials sometimes make with regard to denying a permit for a particular project. It has to do with much more than that particular piece of infrastructure itself. It sometimes has to do with, in the case of pipelines, for example, the product that's flowing through it rather than opposition to the actual infrastructure itself. How do you see a way forward to kind of smooth that as we go? Because uh, it, it seems like everything is polit politicized today um, in, under whatever you're talking about. So I'm just looking for some answers on how we get through this. Yeah, there's no easy answers and there's not a silver bullet to that question, but it's the big one. I think from a policymaker standpoint, what, what policymakers need to understand is the importance of energy infrastructure if we're going to be moving towards the energy grid of the future, which I think most of us see us moving towards, you're going to have to have infrastructure in one way or another. Um, and so it's, it's telling the value of these infrastructure projects to policymakers so they make wise decisions with regard to setting the, the rules of the road. Um, I would say, speaking to a larger audience, which is the general public, energy infrastructure companies, utility companies, have to be honest brokers of information so that they provide constituents, they provide the public with a sense of the trade-offs that exist in the, in the energy industry. Anyone who tells you that the transition that we're going to be going through is going to be easy and fast and it's going to be cheaper and greener and more reliable and we don't have to worry about uh, uh, the transition is, is um, selling a bit of a fairy tale, I think. But I think energy companies can be honest about the trade-offs that exist with different investments that can be made, how that can be made, how can we ensure that this transition is made in the most affordable, reliable way possible. And, and to me, that's the sweet spot for, for energy companies is just getting the information out there so that the public can digest it and understand the trade-offs that, that get made with, with these sorts of decisions. Jason, you testified before the Senate about the role of infrastructure and development earlier. To what extent do you think um, many of them understand the issues well enough to, to make those trade-offs and kind of separate it from voter politics? Well, first of all, it's really um, nice to have this opportunity to engage with uh, this panel and the uh, leadership of uh, EEI. I think it is fair to say that the electric power industry has been showing some tremendous leadership, I think, in the last several years. And as most of you know, all compliments come with um, obligation. I think that uh, this industry is, in fact, going to be the key to navigating this question about whether we can kind of start to build clean and build fast. I think the question about congressional aptitude, um, the answer is always no. Uh, the Congress does not have, by and large, the expertise to navigate this, absent the kind of input uh, that they're gonna need from EEI and others. Um, but I can just tell you, you know, what I presented uh, at this Environment and Public Works Committee gave me, um, at least the response to my presentation, gave me more optimism than I've had in several years. Um, you know, I suggested, and it was not challenged, that we had to achieve a speedy decarbonization of our economy. This idea of net zero emissions by 2050 was not challenged by Democrats or Republicans made the argument that the key to the solution is speed and scale, that um, if one looks at the challenges we face, we are going to have to dramatically accelerate by orders possibly of you know, 5x to 10x, the speed with which we are changing and investing in our economy. Um, I then made the argument that um, if one actually looked honestly at our current regulatory system, you would have to acknowledge that we are not prepared to succeed that the regulatory structure that Tony started to describe simply cannot tolerate the success of that kind of investment. And then I think the, the good news is that at least there is some possibility of a growing coalition to you know, build clean and build fast. I think that if we can start to actually have a shared national commitment to a serious climate solution that responds not just to science, but also to economics and engineering, we might be able to get beyond what I think are kind of the last century fights about particular infrastructure projects and recognize that if we believe as most you know, environmental advocates state that climate change is the most important challenge we face, we then have to accept the logical extension of that, which is that some other things, while not unimportant, are less important. 
and that we're going to have to be able to prioritize that commitment to the climate solution if we actually want to get things done and not run out of time. So maybe I'll ask all of you. Um, there has been uh, quite a bit of pushback on the use of gas and building gas infrastructure and using it as a clean, cleaner fuel as we transition the fleet. Um, how do you think we make the long-term investments that, Sean, you're going to have to make, um, you know, without the use of and support of that kind of gas infrastructure? Sean, do you want to start with that one? Well, you know, I think clearly we think gas in the, in the near term is going to play an important role in our cleaner energy transition. You know, as we look forward beyond that, we're looking for, as an industry and as a company, we're looking for those ideas, those technologies that will actually provide that cleaner source of electricity. You know, we, we're all studying the opportunities around hydrogen. But ultimately, you come back to some sort of economic dispatchable source of energy, i.e. some sort of storage capacity that could fulfill this need. And you know, today, um, in most areas, we do not have a technology that has, that's economic and dispatchable. That doesn't mean we won't get there. But while we're making this journey to that point, we're going to need fuel sources like natural gas to bridge that gap. You know, we're, we're continuing to deploy more renewable resources. We're continuing to test and advocate for more storage resources. But until we get to that point where we've got something that is economic and dispatchable, um, it's going to be hard to eliminate um, a resource such as natural gas. Lori, if I, if I could you know, just jump in. I mean, I, I think there are two achievable steps that need to be taken to have gas be understood to be part of the solution. The first is we have to tell people where we're going, right? What's been missing from this debate until recently is that companies had not felt comfortable or had the information to basically say, here's where we are and here's where we're going to be in 2050. The fact that a number of the nation's you know, leading utilities have now started to tell that story enables people to see how gas can play a role. I think the general environmental community has had the anxiety that natural gas use was just kind of locking in that, you know, high carbon history and couldn't really be part of that transition to a net zero future. I think some of the plans that have been released recently really make that case. I think the second piece of it, which obviously requires your uh, you know, partners in the ENP community, is to demonstrate that we can produce gas effectively, cleanly, address the methane issues. And I think we're also making progress in that direction. And I think if we, if we can do those two things, then you can make the case that you don't accelerate the future by screwing up the present. Right, right now, I think there are people who are so troubled by the lack of a vision for the future the only levers they can pull are to interrupt projects, you know, in their backyard. And um, we have to flip that narrative, which is going to require the leadership of, you know, EEI and a lot of the rest of the major uh, companies leading our economy. Lori, Lori I, think Jason's, I think Jason's comments there are really right on point. Because, you know, to the extent that we're just going to say no to everything, it's really a bridge to nowhere. And um, you know, if we're going to continue to make progress going down the road, we've got to continue to make investments. And it's these investments that we make, that industry makes. You know, there's always a learning that occurs from each investment. And that's how you grow, and that's how you get better. And you, you don't want to stop that innovation and that learning um, and, and wait for something to just arrive we've got to continue to grow and, and keep up with what I believe are rising customer expectations. Yeah, and Laurie, with regard to your question, the, I think it speaks to a, um, a broader debate that's being played out with regard to two schools of thought about how deep decarbonization happens within the electricity sector. One is what I'll call the school of scale. Those folks who believe that in order to get to decarbonization, you need to have a certain amount of scale built at, at, uh, in, in large scale. So it's large renewables hooked up by 
uh, transmission lines backed up by natural gas and pipelines, a retention of the existing nuclear fleet, which is our largest source of, of carbon-free energy, and that that's the best way to drive deep decarbonization in a way that's, that's both reliable and has customer benefits. There's a second school of thought, which is what I'll call the uh, deep disaggregation school of thought, which is um, you don't need the gas pipelines, you don't need new gas plants, you don't need the nuclear units that are out there um, or existing baseload. The, the way to, to achieve deep, deep decarbonization is through extensive use of distributed energy resources, really pushing the pedal to the metal on energy efficiency, um, demand response, um, renewables at, at uh, the distribution level like rooftop solar, things like that. Um, and so those are kind of the two schools of thought that are, are playing out. It's probably interesting to note in the context of what's happened in California this past summer, that that really is within the United States, probably the most extreme example of attempting to uh, uh, push the disaggregation narrative. I think there's gonna be some blowback against that given what's, what's happened, but that's the debate you're gonna be seeing playing out is this, this debate between scale and whether that's the best way to achieve deep decarb or whether it's disaggregation and uh, a lot of investments at the edge of the, the network as opposed to um, more at the center of the network. And does that, um, in your mind, bring you back to thinking about a policy for that, that in, creates the right incentives around net metering? Yeah, well, net metering is certainly a part and it's something that's been, uh, California is probably the, uh, one of the preeminent examples of, of where net metering has been used to, to um, incent and, and in many ways, I argue, subsidize uh, distributed energy resources at the, at the edge of the grid. Um, so that's, that's certainly part of it. But I think you're going to see this, this debate playing out where in terms of incentives, as you, you asked about, how do we make sure that the the policy incentives, the regulatory incentives, and the way that our wholesale energy markets are set up somehow align financial viability with grid reliability. Um, it's not an easy task to do. In, in the old days where the, the system was in some ways much simpler, um, it, was, it was not easy, but it was easier to do. When you have so much power at the, the edge of the network, um, power both in terms of, of real actual power, but also power in consumers' hands. It gets to be a much trickier um, thing for, for grid operators to, uh, to ensure reliability. So the regulations and regulators are catching up to this, this new reality, but it's, it's not going to be an easy task ensuring that those incentives exactly align with the outcome that I think most consumers want, which is affordable, reliable energy. If I could pick up, I, I think the, the suggestion that there are two choices, kind of go big or go small, is I think generous. Um, but I believe that probably most of us on this call would imagine that you need to obviously double down on efficiency. You're going to need demand response. But I've never seen a credible proposal that argues that we can decarbonize the United States economy absent like industrial strength, zero carbon power. And I think that this is actually somewhat derivative of the even larger debate we're having in society, which is mistrust of big, mistrust of big government, mistrust of big organizations, mistrust of big industry. And it does again come back to leadership. Um, I think if the big institutions in this country start to show leadership, we will actually see the public start to support those plans. And I think there's been a, you know, this is a little bit simplistic, but if you look at the last couple of decades, you know, Two decades ago, you know, the answer to can we decarbonize was no. Over the last decade, it's been yes, but, and then the buts got very, very long. What I think is changing now is the answer is yes, and. If, you know, a democratic government comes forward and wants decarbonization by 2035 of the power sector, that's exceptionally challenging. But if the answer is yes, and, the government's gonna to have to make significant investments in innovation and de-risking first mover plants. Yes, and we're gonna to have to use all available technologies. We can't have cultural preferences about how we decarbonize. Yes, and we have to greatly facilitate and streamline the siting process to do this at scale. Then we're having a discussion about success. And then I think you're gonna see the public, not all, but enough of the public kind of rally behind that realization. Tony, you uh, have written about um, 
kind of a what you call nihilism. I'll call um, a lot of the players in the market kind of talking their own book, which uh, utilities did at some point given their legacy assets, but have done very little love in my mind over the last five or at least five years. How, how do you see creating the consensus so that, you know, the clean energy doesn't get caught up in some of the siting issues and what are the things that we need to streamline so that we can get some of this done in a coordinated way? Yeah, I think the, the comment with regard to regulatory nihilism in the op-ed that I wrote several weeks ago was this idea that certain stakeholder groups have sometimes approached public policy, whether it's related to federal state jurisdiction or market rules, things like that, in a way that really is based more on what is the outcome of what helps what resources, and then I'll build my argument around, around the outcome <laughs> that I want at the end. And that's... Um, it's kind of a dangerous way to approach energy policy. It's a dangerous way to approach any sort of um, precedent when it comes to the government, because those tools that you use and sharpen against your opponent can then later be used against you. And I think that's what, uh, what you referenced with regard to um, uh, some of these uh, arguments that have been used against certain, say, pipelines now being used against large transmission lines, which might facilitate um, renewable development across large regions of the country. So that's, that's certainly a danger. I think what, what as policymakers, um, what needs to happen is just make sure that you're approaching things from uh, a consistent standpoint and with some sort of objective in mind. I think the way that Jason put it is exactly correct. If you can provide a vision for where we are going to the American public and to consumers and how we're gonna get there and explain to them in a way that's that's well reasoned, I think that they can rally behind that, and so that's that's part of it. But in the absence of that, we're just left with this sort of uh, uh, ad hoc warfare based on different resources and everyone trying to to make a case for a specific resource, as opposed to some sort of vision for how we actually um, move to a modernized grid. Sean, as you think about um, you know the difficulty of building infrastructure and delays and changing policy initiatives. How do you think about making some of the long-term investments and spending the big dollars you need to achieve the infrastructure that will support all of this? Yeah, a great question. You know, and if you look at, you know, our industry, I think DEI, we, we state that, you know, we're 5% of the total investments in the country. And we'd argue we're the first 5% because we enable all these other industries out there. And so our business is capital intensive. Tony mentioned about some of this infrastructure. These are long, long-term assets. And in particular, when we start talking about generation, that's probably the most difficult decision we can make because you're looking and you're forecasting technology changes, could be fuel changes, could be regulatory policy changes, could be federal policy changes. And so you're, you're making a calculation of what exactly happened. And unfortunately, most of these large infrastructure investments you make, you're investing a lot of time, energy, and money to figure out how to navigate through the approval process, defend yourself against those that would oppose it for one reason or another. And I think the real missed opportunity there is, you know, we're missing the opportunity for, as Tony mentioned, some of the opportunities to expand and open up some of the renewable corridors. But the opportunity there around the business is, where is the innovation and the creativity and the ingenuity to really look at those infrastructure projects in terms of what they bring forward? And have that be the measure of success in terms of rewarding the execution of the project safely and delivering them on time and on budget, not, not recognizing the success is whether you get through the approval. And um, so these are very difficult decisions for us and across the industry from a changing landscape, whether we're talking about federal or state, whether we're talking about different administrations, whether it's different policies. And so the more streamlined and kind of the rules of the road that we all could agree to, uh, where we're going as Jason talked about it, that vision for the future, 
we all can march there. We've done a very good job up to this point as an industry. There's absolutely, as I look at it, there's every incentive, incentive for us to continue to get cleaner. There's every incentive for us to maintain our affordability. And there's every incentive for us to improve the reliability. As I speak to our customers, I think the good news there is their expectations are increasing on us. And I, I like that proposition. You want people to have higher expectations of you. And when, when I look at across those three metrics there, um, if I surveyed our customer class and you did this across the country, they would prioritize those three elements differently each time. And I think the opportunity for us as an industry is to balance all those and continue to deliver on those, those metrics. So uh, we're getting close to wrapping up. I just would, as you look into our crystal balls, what are your predictions for the future of the infrastructure? What, what areas do you think will develop more quickly than people expect and what might be the biggest bottleneck? I'll just ask each of you. Well, I'll, I'll uh, take a, a short shot at that um, long question. Um, look, you know, I'm an optimist, but I have to be honest, on our current trajectory, we're going to run out of time. We are going to solve the technology problems and fail the democracy challenge. And I think we have to be kind of, you know, kind of open-eyed about that. And I think, you know, business leaders are going to have to start to really engage the fact that, you know, democracy is the best way to run a country. But if you're trying to build stuff fast, the central committee is really handy. And we do have a federalism challenge. This is a global problem which requires national solutions, yet we are making these decisions at the state and often local level. And while it is exceedingly difficult for the National Governors Association to get behind anything that aggrandizes federal authority, that is the only way we're gonna get this done in time. And so I think that we need to start really talking to governors and mayors and, you know, state legislatures about this kind of shared national commitment we have and recognize that every region of the country is going to have to be making a contribution to that success. Um, or I think we will not succeed in time to avoid what are, you know, I think, untenable impacts of a changing climate. Yeah, so as to your question about uh, crystal ball and, and where things are heading, I think over the, the long term, the long term mark and the long term trends, um, that we see moving forward. There I feel like I have a fairly good amount of, of certainty and I kind of think I know where things are heading. I mean, we're moving towards a less carbon intensive grid. It's gonna be a grid that will, I believe, continue to have a lot of large scale investments because as Jason said, I mean, I think he's exactly right. In order to get to where we need to go, you simply have to have that, but it's going to be more interactive and there's gonna be more things happening at the edge of, of the grid as well. So that that trend I think is pretty similar regardless. It's the short term that I don't have a very good crystal ball and this relates to, this relates to timing. Um, timing of how do investments get made? Given whoever is in the White House at any particular time or, or controlling FERC or controlling individual states, what sort of investments get made in those states and on what timeline and is there a, re a reasonable and feasible case that allows those investments to be made? Um, those are things that to me are, are very unclear and from a, uh, an investment standpoint, from an industry standpoint, I'm sure that's what's most frustrating for the industry is that these decisions have to be made now um, and the timeline for making them is such that they need to be made relatively quickly. Um, I don't think it changes the long-term arc of where we eventually get, but I, th I think the, these um, near-term decisions the more clarity that can be brought sooner is going to be helpful to the industry and ultimately to consumers. Sean, we'll yeah. end with you. Okay, and, and I, would, I would just tag along with what Tony said. It's, it's really that short-term clarity that um, I think would be enabling for a lot of the initiatives we've talked about on this panel. And, um, you know, as, as, as I think about, you know, the issues before us, I too am an optimist. And I believe that there's been so much resistance to just about everything, and it, whether it's transmission lines to re renewable resources. Um, I think there's been so much optimism or so much resistance to all of that, that nothing is getting done. And sometimes you have to reach that, that stalemate point where nothing gets done and everybody's able to take a step back and realize, look, 
we need to work together. We need to have a common vision and together we need to move forward. So I'm, I'm optimistic that this short term um, dilemma we're in, um, we'll all realize that we've got to work together to uh, bridge to the future. Thanks everybody. Um, this has been a really terrific discussion and uh, now we'll open it up to question and answers from uh, the audience. Thanks.